Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description for more details. My name is Sava, and today, following your requests, we're investigating the automatic variance ratio test as of CHOI 1999. And as usual, we're going to apply the automatic variance ratio test to detect inefficiencies potentially in S&P 500 daily returns for a five-year period from end of March 2016 until end of March 2021. And as you might remember, we have already investigated the same data set using variance ratio tests of Law and McKinley, including the heteroscedasticity consistent variance ratio test of Law and McKinley, and also the Chow Denning multiple testing adjustment of the variance ratio test. So please check those videos out later if you're interested in those particular topics. However, today our hero is the Choi 1999 Automatic Variance Ratio Test, or AVR for short. The main purpose of the automatic variance ratio test is to derive the optimal lag length to calculate your automatic variance ratio. As we know, for most of previously derived uh, variance ratio tests, you either select lags arbitrarily, for example as powers of 2, or you test for as many lags as possible and then control for multiple testing somehow. However, what Choi proposed is to derive this lag length using a data-dependent uh, technique that was first proposed in Andrews 1991, actually in the context of hydroscedasticity and autocorrelation consistent covariance matrices, but Choi showed that this particular approach that heavily utilizes quadratic spectral kernel to estimate the density of the distribution, that this approach is very much applicable to variance ratio tests. Another very commonly cited heuristic that Choi uses is that your variance ratio test can be actually represented as a weighted sum of autocorrelation coefficients over different lags. So basically, if you are investigating the variance ratio over 100 uh, lags, then it will be a weighted sum of autocorrelation coefficients up to 99. And uh, what the um, Choi automatic variance ratio test proposes is to uh, go with the maximum number of uh, lags that you can feasibly do, so n minus 1. So here you do not stop at, for example, l minus 1, where l is the number of lags, isn't it? So you go as far as you can go, but you inversely weigh those autocorrelations by this particular formula, this particular function, k of i divided by l. And this is where the quadratic spectral kernel actually comes into the picture. And we can see that this basically uses the logic of uh, convergent series. And here, as x grows large, this particular uh, weight would become smaller and smaller, so that it will converge to a well-behaved variance ratio, regardless of how large of, of a sample you've got. However, the concept of how to determine this optimal uh, lag length L still stands um, unresolved. And here Andrews 1991 comes to the rescue. Um, Andrews has proven that for the quadratic spectral uh, density kernel, uh, the optimal lag length L can be expressed as um, that calibrated function based on the number of observations n, this constant 1.3221 that were uh, estimated using simulations, and this uh, function L4 of 2 that is data dependent. So it depends on how autocorrelated and how volatile your data set is. And this is how to calculate L4 of 2. And here we see that it's a weighted sum uh, using some weight that most commonly is assumed to be equal to 1. So you can just disregard those. Those um, coefficients are here just for generality. Andrews uh, himself states that you just most commonly plug them as 1s. And here uh, we have got uh, this weighted sum of terms that consist of um, correlations, so autocorrelations of particular lags, A from 1 to P, and again you can go um, as high as possible, as high as you want with those uh, number of lags, 
and also the residual uh, variances uh, sigma squared a for a particular number of lags. So basically, how much variance is left unexplained when you control for uh, autocorrelation at a particular lag length. And what is quite handy here is that uh, those autocorrelations also go into the calculations of the variance ratio, so we uh, do not lose anything by actually calculating them uh, first uh, to get our optimal lag length as well. So here we have got our returns, and we also um, see how the results compare if you plug in just um, a normal random variable, so just a Monte Carlo simulation basically, whether the results would be different to kind of verify whether the test works or not. So first let's just count how many observations we've got for our uh, real-world stock returns, uh, 1258 as usual, five years worth of data, quite typical. And now uh, to get our uh, alpha 2 statistic and our um, optimal lag length L, we can calculate uh, the autocorrelations and residual standard deviations for lag lengths from 1 all the way to 12 1256. 1256 being basically the largest lag length that you can still calculate autocorrelation for. So here, to calculate autocorrelation of various lags, and those would also be um, equivalent to autoregressive coefficients of uh, a simple uh, one parametric um, autoregressive model. So here, those serve both purposes, both here and here, as already mentioned. Here we can just calculate it using the corel correlation function and throw in a bunch of indices. So first, we'll calculate the correlation of returns starting from the very first return, so b log 2, all the way to the index of this area of returns with locked rows throughout. And here, the identification number would be n, which is conveniently calculated over here, minus the lag. So the lag would be in this cell, uh, a 1270. And the second array would start uh, at the uh, 1 plus uh, lag element. So if we want to calculate the autocorrelation for lag length of 1, we'll uh, first start at the second uh, return and end at the last return. And here we'll start at the first return and end at the second to last return. That's what those index functions are here for. So index of, again, the whole array. And here... Uh, we just type in 1 plus this particular cell, A1270. And then we go all the way to the very end, cell B1259. And that will allow us to calculate uh, autocorrelations of various lags. So we see that the autocorrelation at lag length 1 is negative, then it becomes positive at length 2, and then it evolves and fluctuates until it gets to pretty... Um, chaotic values uh, later on down the line. For example, here, autocorrelation is minus one simply because you've got just two observations, and by definition, if you've got only two observations, your autocorrelation will be either one or minus one, isn't it? And now we can calculate the residual standard deviation. Here we can actually copy um, this particular representation of the array of uh, returns and calculate the sample standard deviation of such returns and multiply them uh, by the square root of 1 minus uh, autocorrelation coefficient squared. That basically would be the uh, variance of innovation or unexplained variance when you account for autocorrelation. And we can uh, enforce this formula and bottom left click it all the way down to get our residual standard deviations down the line as well. And now for our alpha of 2 coefficient that can be used to calculate the optimal number of lags L, we can simply uh, calculate the sum of, again, here, just disregard the weights, those are equal to 1 as per Andrews, 4 times the uh, autocorrelation squared, and here let's disregard the last two observations because they are very close to 1, so that our estimator is not as noisy as it would be otherwise, so the square of those two, and then we multiply it uh, by the residual standard deviations up to, again, the same uh, row to the power of 4, because those are standard deviations and this is sigma to the power of 4, as we can verify quite easily from over here. And then we divide it by 1 minus this area of autocorrelations to the power of 8. And this is the first component of our sum, and then we divide it by the weighted sum in the denominator. And here again we use 
standard deviations to the power of 4 divided by 1 minus autocorrelations all quantity raised to the power of 4. And we can enforce this formula to show control answer and get uh, alpha of 2 uh, constant being equal to 0 0.14. And now we can calculate the optimal lag length and again just input this formula over here 1.3 to 1 times alpha of 2 times n all these parentheses raised to the power of one fifth. And we can see that the optimal number of lags is 3.70. And now we can calculate the adjusted uh, parameter i over l for all particular lag lengths that we can then use to estimate our quadratic spectral uh, density kernel and uh, calculate the weighted um, variance ratio, weighted sum of autocorrelation coefficients. So here i over l is just the number of the lag divided by L. Again, we can just bottom right click it all the way down. And here we can calculate uh, K of X, which would be the quadratic spectral uh, kernel. So 25 divided by 12 pi squared times X squared. So we refer to this cell over here. Times this parentheses that revolve around trigonometric functions of our um, scaled X. So we first do the sine of 6 times pi times x divided by 5. Then we divide it by the argument of the function. So 6 times uh, x times pi uh, over 5. And, and we subtract the cos function of the same argument. And we enforce this formula and bottom click it all the way down. And we can see how fast it decays to uh, values very close to 0. So or even uh, with lag length of 252, for example. Uh, here you've got some uh, non-negligible values, but you can see how closely it converges to zero by the virtue of x squared being in the denominator. And uh, the greater L is, the slower this decay is, so it means that the variance ratio would be uh, less penalizing for a longer-term autocorrelation if it is so required by the procedure uh, estimated using the quadratic spectral uh, density kernel. And now we actually can already calculate the test statistic, so we can see that um, the variance ratio minus 1 is normally distributed with uh, uh, mean 0 and uh, variance to L over n, so we can calculate our test statistic as the portion of this uh, formula without plus 1, so 2 times the sum product of our autocorrelation coefficients, and we multiply them across multiply by those weights calculated using the quadratic spectral uh, density kernel. And we get a test statistic of minus 0 0.21. And then we can calculate the standard error as per this uh, particular formula. So the variance is 2L divided by N. So the standard error is the square root of that. So 2 times L divided by N. And we see that the standard error of 0 0.08. So we can convert it into a z-stat because it's asymptotically normally distributed. A z-stat of minus 2.79 uh, means that uh, the result is uh, obviously significant using any uh, rule of thumb. But to be uh, very, very rigorous, let's calculate the p-value. 2 times 1 minus standard normal distribution of the absolute value of the z-stat cumulative. Close the parentheses and get a p-value of 0.52%, which is significant at 1%, meaning that the market is indeed inefficient and uh, the variance ratio is significantly negative. That would imply that the weighted autocorrelation function is negative. That would imply anti-persistence or the mean reverting nature of S&P 500 returns. And to visualize the power of the test, we can also see that it doesn't reject the null hypothesis of randomness for a, a normal random variable, some um, random variables we have generated over here. Uh, so if we paste it over here, we see that for those particular returns, it produces a very high p-value, uh, meaning that it's quite unlikely that there is any pattern in random data. And that's exactly what we want for a test, to be able to detect uh, dependencies in uh, data that manifests those properties and uh, stick with the null hypothesis if the data is truly random. And that is the 
automatic variance ratio by Choi 1999 and its implementation in Excel. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, make it to see any further suggestions in videos for business, finance, or economics topics you would like me to record. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel and consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.